Welcome everybody. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce you today and to welcome Dr. Taraz Lee, who's visiting us from Ann Arbor, Michigan. Uh, Dr. Lee is a cognitive neuroscientist who studies cognitive control, but in very interesting and broad ways. Uh, for example, how it helps regulate other lower order systems like skilled action and, and motor control. Um, he also wins the prize for most interesting undergrad degree program. He got his um, undergraduate degree in symbolic systems at Stanford, um, went on to earn a PhD uh, at UC Berkeley, did a stint as a postdoc at UC Santa Barbara, and now is at the University of Michigan, where he is an assistant professor in the psychology department. And one thing that um, drew me to Taraz's work is he uses a wide array of techniques in his research, uh, including computational modeling, fMRI, TMS, behavioral experiments, and most recently, uh, neurological patient models um, to study these types of things. And so today he's going to talk about um, well, I won't spoil it, actually. Um, a couple of different um, examples of this types of research. You'll see what I mean in a minute. Um, but encompassed under the title of the multifaceted impact of reward on cognition and skilled action. So please join me in a very warm welcome uh, to Dr. Lee. Well, thank you very much, Kristen, for that kind of introduction. Thanks, everybody, for uh, coming. Uh, I know the title is a bit of a mouthful that mostly just lets me talk about whatever I want because it's a kind of a broad overview of everything. Um, so I usually like to start with definitions. I know it might not be um, necessary for this crowd, uh, but we will be talking about cognitive control quite a bit. So um, as a flavor of what that, uh, what that means, I want you all to imagine that you're driving in this car, uh, but not around Dallas, but um, in mainland China. Um, so rules of the road, mostly the same. You're not going to have too much of a problem. You might want to have Google Maps open because you can't read the signs or something like that, but it'll probably be just fine if you uh, are an expert driver. However, if you cross over into Hong Kong, you might encounter a lot of issues. So being a former British colony, you drive on the left side of the road. Um, so now you're going to have to engage in a lot of extra processes just for this task of driving. Uh, you're going to have to actively maintain this rule, driving the left side of the road as you're going along. You're going to have to change where you deploy your attention, so you probably have to monitor for traffic in different places. And when you take actions, let's say you're making a left turn, you're going to have to go into a different lane. So you're going to have to override some of your automatic and habitual actions in the service of this new goal. Um, and you might imagine if you're commuting back and forth from mainland China, Hong Kong, you also might have to do some task switching, driving left, driving right. Um, so all these kinds of processes, the active maintenance of your uh, uh, task relevant goals, uh, overriding pre-proton responses. These are the kinds of processes that um, I'm referring to when I use the terms cognitive control or top-down control. Um, and you might imagine if you're going to, let's say, a job interview in Hong Kong and you're very motivated to get there on time, you might be better able to uh, uh, carry out some of these processes. And so there's a lot of experimental evidence that this kind of thing's the case, that motivation is going to actually enhance our ability to use cognitive control uh, in the service of our goals. Um, so like Kristen mentioned, I'm very interested in action as well and motor control. Um, and so there's a lot of evidence, um, both anecdotally and experimentally, that top-down control and cognitive control can actually aid skilled action. Um, so I love to use the example of golf. It's great to have a golf course out here, but you know, millions and billions of dollars are spent every year on golf instruction from golf pros to magazine subscriptions. And it is true that if you have you know, some high-level goal that a coach gives you, you know, keep your left arm straight as you're swinging, uh, that could actually improve your golf game a bit. At the same time, we all have this kind of intuition that this is not the thing we want to be doing when we are when it's go time, right? So the Masters just concluded, right? So on the final day of a tournament, maybe this is not what exactly we are trying to be doing. And there's, uh, again, a lot of experimental evidence that's specifically for experts. Uh, you don't really want to be taking control over any kind of automatic action that could actually be disruptive. Um, so I'm kind of interested in both sides of this. Uh, how does cognitive control work? How is it instantiated in the brain? How does it help skilled action? Are the situations in which it hurts um, kind of uh, the, the, so both sides of this coin of how cognitive control can aid and uh, harm uh, skilled actions and uh, other kinds of processes. Um, so my lab, the Cognition Control and Action Lab, we study kind of the intersection between cognitive control, motivation, uh, and action. Um, as Chris had mentioned, again, we do a lot of behavioral experiments, um, especially over the pandemic, having all of our uh, cognitive pause. Like a lot of people, we've kind of leaned into um, uh, computational modeling and behavioral experiments. After we feel like we have a pretty good handle on our behaviors, we do do new emerging. Um, uh, uh, lots of different kinds of uh, emerging experiments with multivariate and univariate techniques. And finally, once we figure out uh, the kind of uh, brain areas and the networks involved, we use uh, TMS, or transcranial magnetic stimulation, 
usually disruptive to try to disrupt the areas of the brain that we think are important for certain functions um, to see that how that impacts both uh, um, uh, brain activation but also uh, behavioral performance. Um, so uh, today I thought I'd start off talking about um, uh, some modeling, co computational modeling work we've been doing with behavior. Uh, to, it's happening this really cool paradigm for motor control to take a look at uh, some uh, uh, cognitive control. Um, and then after that, it's going to kind of be a choose your own adventure. Um, so I selected out uh, five studies that kind of give a flavor of all the kinds of things the lab does, and I'll let you all vote on which ones you want to hear about. Um, I will come back to these. I'm just going to kind of signpost them here, so then the back of your mind, but I will bring this back up uh, when it's time to vote. Um, so if you like the flavor of the modeling that I presented first, we could uh, keep going down that path to ask the question, what happens after an error? So this is looking at uh, adaptive control, and there's this um, uh, big finding in the literature that people slow down after an error, but it seems like cognitive processing is messed up in some way that's been hard to determine. Um, so we could look at what happens after an error. Um, I could present some uh, neuro uh, study that came out last year looking at how reward impacts um, uh, the representations of skilled motor planning. So kind of looking at how planning and cognitive control might aid uh, uh, skilled motor actions. Um, if you're interested in like kind of downside of things, I could talk about some of the work I did in my postdoc at Santa Barbara, looking at uh, what's going on when we're choking under pressure at these high pressure moments. Why is it that we fail sometimes? Um, kind of along the same vein, but if you don't like motor control specifically, we could look at motor decision making. Um, so how incentives uh, affect visual motor decision making, deciding where to move. I um, mean, finally, if you don't care about action at all, we could look at just working memory and go uh, look at how reward impacts specific working memory processes. What specific working memory processes are impacted um, uh, when we're more motivated? Um, so again, I'll bring the slide back up when it's time to vote. This is just to kind of signpost them. Uh, but let's start off with uh, this first question, how motivation uh, impacts the balance between goal-directed and habitual actions. Um, so as I mentioned in that uh, slide with the driving in Hong Kong, and you're motivated, um, there's a lot of experimental evidence that rewards can actually enhance uh, what's called proactive cognitive control. Um, so a typical task you might see in these uh, cognitive control experiments is something like this. Um, it's kind of like a modified Stroop-ish task where um, you're seeing an image. It can either be a house or a building in this case. Overlaid on top of that's a word. The word can either be house or building or some neutral words like an animal. Um, and the typical finding um, is that when uh, word reading being automatic, uh, if this word can flex your task is actually um, say whether the image is a house or a building, if this word is conflicting, that would be an incongruent trial. You typically are slower on those trials and faster when it's congruent. Um, so uh, what is found generally in the literature is that um, if you give people cash incentives for this, um, you see across the board that um, people are faster to respond and a little bit more accurate. Um, but specifically, you see the biggest benefit in this incongruent case where you have to engage in some cognitive control to override that habitual uh, uh, word reading response, uh, response to the word, um, and to actually respond to your goal. Um, one of the issues with this is um, that it's been hard to determine whether rewards are really impacting uh, these goal-directed processing or the inhibition of your, your habitual responding. Um, so is it boosting up your ability to uh, name that image or kind of tamping down any kind of interference you get in this uh, word reading? Um, and a big problem for this um, kind of work is that re response time is a confounded measure. Um, so I've been very impacted by this paper that came out, uh, I guess, six, seven years ago now by Adrian Haith and colleagues at Johns Hopkins. Um, so this is uh, some motor control work showing that uh, when we initiate our responses is not a good measure of how long it took to prepare that response. Um, so I'm going to kind of talk us through what I'm talking about there. Um, so this is a kind of task that's pretty common in motor control. Um, so people, uh, you can have like an infrared sensor on your finger, but it's going to be hidden. So you see a cursor where your arm is. You start in the center. One of these peripheral locations is going to light up. All you have to do is reach out and touch that yellow circle when it appears. So if you look at people's uh, reaction time or response time here, this is um, a, a cumulative probability distribution of when people's, how fast the response time is. So down here, for example, 5% of the responses are 150 milliseconds or faster. Uh, you know, about at 200 milliseconds, 50% of your responses are 200 milliseconds or faster, all the way up to 100. 100% um, is around, everybody's 300 milliseconds is kind of the slowest that you can go in this task. Um, so seems like average response time is about 250 milliseconds. Um, a lot of cognitive psychology rests on the idea that that response time is indicative of the cognitive processing underlying um, uh, preparing that response. 
However, what uh, uh, Haith and colleagues did was they showed that if you force people to respond earlier, they're actually hyper accurate way earlier than their entire reaction time distribution would suggest. Um, so I'm going to get into in a second how you can force people to respond at particular times. But if you do force people to respond at um, particular times, this blue curve is showing um, basically accuracy. So it's no longer um, uh, a, a cumulative distribution, but this is just accuracy when forced to respond at 100 milliseconds. People are pretty bad at chance, basically. But once you get to, let's say, 150 milliseconds or so, people are at ceiling levels of performance. So they're 100% accurate, way faster than all of their response times. OK? Another way of showing that is like this. Um, so uh, uh, this is uh, how fast, uh, if you're, your accurate response are, each of these dots is an individual person. Uh, on the y-axis here is their uh, free response time uh, on average for, for those responses and how um, uh, when they get to basically ceiling levels of performance when you force them to respond and everybody's above this. So they're much slower than their forced RT would suggest um, that they need to be. Um, so returning back to goal direct and habitual actions, um, in some sense, goal direct and habitual actions compete for action selection. So if you have this word reading response, it's kind of stroop task uh, versus uh, responding to the, the image, uh, they're kind of competing for separate actions. Um, it's really hard to induce habitual responding in humans. So in those cognitive control tasks, accuracy is at 90 something percent. Uh, you don't actually see people make those errors very often. And we have to infer that from slowed RT. But just like I showed in that last slide, RT is kind of a, a, a wonky measure for, for kind of inferring these things. Um, and so the submission responding is, is really masked by these goal-directed responses in humans specifically. So when we want to ask this question, what does motivation do to the balance between these processes? It can be kind of hard to ask this question with a, a free response paradigm. Um, so uh, what we did was kind of adopt that uh, paradigm for motor control to ask a, a very basic question about uh, cognitive control using a pretty classic cognitive control task called assignment task. Um, so if you're unfamiliar with it, uh, participants uh, task is to just respond based on the color of the stimulus. So if it's blue, you press your left hand. If it's green, you press your right hand. Um, this stimulus can appear on either the left or the right side of the screen. However, uh, if it appears on the left side of the screen and it's blue, that would be congruent. There's no uh, uh, habit goal conflict. It's very prepotent response to respond on the side of the screen um, uh, and the location of an item. Uh, so you can have congruent and incongruent trials uh, if the uh, color is conflicting with the location. Um, and so how do, force, how do we force people to respond at particular times? Um, I'm going to do that, but you're going to see how we do that right here. This bar is going to fill up in black, and when it reaches the end, I just want everybody to clap, okay? Okay, uh, now same thing, just snap if it when it reaches the end of the bar. Great, everybody's awesome. Uh, so I can force it to respond to a particular time, and then what I can vary as the experimenter is when I present you that stimulus, okay? So I want everybody to monitor uh, the central location here. It's either gonna be a clap symbol or a snap symbol, and then you're not gonna respond until it fills up all the way though, okay? So you're gonna make your response when it fills up all the way. You're not gonna know what the re response is until a little bit later on, okay? Some people are a little early, okay. Very good. Yeah, I can respond to give it to you very late. Okay, you guys are a little bit late. We train people to get this timing for, you know, 60 trials or so. Um, so basically what we do is we have people do the Simon task and we, they have these uh, response times cues, RT cues. Um, we can do this in a couple different ways. We can either have a filling bar or just, um, Kind of like flashing RTQs, like beep, 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 go, beep, 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 go. We've done it differently in different experiments. Um, and what we vary is when you get that stimulus, okay? Um, so the nice thing about this is we can essentially build people's speed axis trade off curve, okay? So um, if this is like chance level performance, at early time points, if I gave you that stimulus right at the very end, you're basically guessing when you have to respond. You make a response, but it's gonna be a guess response. Uh, if I give, if I present the stimulus very early, I, you're at ceiling levels of performance. Uh, but I can essentially sample and build a seamless response curve or a speed actually uh, trade off function. Um, so this is the assignment task that we did. Um, I just wanted to show that people are pretty good that so that everybody has to respond at uh, 2500 milliseconds on every trial. Uh, there's some variability around that, but people are pretty tight around when we want them to respond. And what we're varying, so what I'm showing down here is just a histogram of when we present that stimulus. So we kind of uniformly uh, sample uh, how much time they have to prepare that response. So how much processing time or how much preparation time they have. And um, one of the nice things about uh, using this paradigm is it lends itself really well to this uh, competition model of response preparation. Um, 
And so the basic idea behind this model is that um, you fairly simple assumption that uh, uh, your responses are prepared around some mean time. OK, so um, let's say a habitual response is prepared on average around 200 milliseconds, but there's some variability in how long it takes you to um, uh, make that response from trial to trial. Um, same thing with the goal. It's a separate um, uh, process. So the assumption of this model are that goals and habits are prepared via separate processes. Habits are prepared more quickly than goals. Hopefully all of these are unobjectable. Yes. Yes, please. I would love to take questions during. Are you concerned about the potential for a potential? Yeah, so that's that's one of the uh, yeah big things that we're thinking about is like, is this a dual task in and of itself? So, yeah. More than that, though, is the closer the response Mm -hmm. So you're saying the, the closer in time that you present the stimulus to the. Uh, hold on, say more about the confound preparation time besides the divided attention. What's the. Well, the point is, I'm sitting there and I'm looking at the bar going like mm -hmm. this, and I'm also monitoring the response. Yeah. If I know what responses I have to make early on, mm -hmm. then I can focus all of my attention on watching the bar. Mm -hmm. the oh, you're saying there's going to be more dual tasking as it gets exactly closer right. to the time. Exactly. Mm. That, yeah, I'm going to show you in a second some data that may. So early. I mean, maybe it's maybe it's potential because of the dual tasking. If you don't give people enough time to respond, if it comes right before, people are essentially at chance yeah. levels of performance anyway. So, um, but the other thing that's nice about this is that people get pretty entrained into the timing. So it's very reg it's very regularly spaced. So um, you can, I don't know how to say it. I mean, the, the cues, you, you need the cues to keep you kind of on track, but the, you're making a response basically every three and a half seconds, basically. So people get like, I'm sure I can show you another slide with the timing, but people are pretty good at the timing. I don't think they really have. To, once you get into your groove or whatever of responding, I think it's, I don't know if I'd say automatic necessarily, but it's fairly automatic when you're responding actually on this test. Um, uh, that is a good question. That does, I think we should maybe return to that when we go to the interpretation of whether the, um, how the dual task might affect this. Um, uh, the one thing I will say is that it's unlikely that that is, well, okay, let's, let's wait till we get to the conclusions maybe and see how that, how we've changed our interpretation. Um, um, so assumptions, uh, goals and habits are prepared via separate processes. Uh, habits are prepared more quickly than goals. Um, the exact time of preparation varies around some mean, like I said uh, before. And once uh, the other assumptions model that um, we're making is that once your goal is prepared, once that action is prepared, it kind of over automatically overrides the ability action at a high, um, uh, uh, very high rate, like 90 something percent. Um, so the thing that we get back from this model is um, we can estimate the mean and the standard deviation of preparing this goal direct response or habitual response. And um, then what we can do is that at any given time, we know how likely it is that a habit is prepared or a goal is prepared, uh, inferring that from the people's data. Um, um, so just to show you some initial data just on assignment task with no rewards, uh, what I'm plotting here is accuracy uh, on uh, the assignment task. So chance is 50% because there's two responses here. And along the x-axis, how much preparation time we give folks. Um, we'll start with blue is those congruent trials. So early on, they're basically just guessing. At around 200 milliseconds or so, people can start uh, uh, making some accurate responses. And around 300 milliseconds, they're asking with levels of performance. Um, in the incongruent case, what's really, what I really like about this paradigm is that we can actually induce people to make habitual errors. So if we densely sample at this early time point, they're likely to express the habitual error they just never see in a, with humans in, in these kinds of tasks. Um, um, and so when we return to this question of what motivation does, we can uh, use our modeling to formulate different hypotheses for what motivation might be doing. So for example, uh, reward and motivation might be inhibiting the pre preparation of these habits. Um, so in, in pink is uh, this habit distribution. Uh, as we go from low reward to high reward, it might be uh, shifting that later in time. Um, that will come with some uh, behavioral response profile like I showed in that previous slide. Um, but you might imagine what's going on is reward, uh, and there's a lot of uh, other evidence for this is that reward is selectively enhancing goal preparation uh, and, and these cognitive control processes let you really focus in on the goal and enhancing goal relevant information. That would have a different behavioral profile, but also uh, come out in our model as a shift in the mean of just the goal direct pre preparation or um, uh, some combination of the two actually. Um, so um, <clears throat> we had people do this rewarded Simon task. Um, 
uh, in this study, the rewards were blocked. So they on every single trial, they would see a reward queue saying $1 or $5. Um, for everything I present today, the way we used um, rewards is that at the end of the experiment, we pick a trial at random. If you got that trial correct, you win the associated reward amount. Um, so they're not accumulating money over the course of the experiment. I think there's actually a lot of problems with doing that if anybody's interested in um, what that is. Uh, but this basically ensures that people are independently evaluating reward in every single trial. Um, so they can't earn a big pot of money. They don't care at the end of the experiment because they don't know which trial is going to be selected. Um, um, OK, so force assignment task with rewards. Uh, what do we see? So um, behavior. Um, so again, plotting accuracy here, chance is 50%. Uh, this is how much processing time or preparation time they have along the X axis uh, in the light colors are low reward in the uh, darker colors is the high reward. Um, hopefully what pops out at everybody is that as we go from low to high reward, we're really eliminating a lot of these habitual errors. OK, um, so we're making a lot fewer habitual errors. You see a little bit of movement back and forth in the congruent, uh, but not as dramatic as um, as nice habitual errors. Um, so just looking at this can be hard to tell. Um, uh, OK, is this inhibiting habits or uh, boosting up goals? Um, so we can turn to our modeling. Um, and what our modeling results are suggesting is that it's selective on the goal. OK, so we see that we're selectively speeding these goal direct responses. We don't see actually any evidence for um, where's my cursor, uh, any movement on this habitual uh, uh, distribution. Um, my training has been really fond of using uh, uh, Bayesian parameter estimation for their analyses, so uh, which I really like too, because you can see the strength of the evidence. So we're basically at, um, so this is the change in that mean of these distributions, uh, you know, centered around zero, no real evidence that anything's happening that happened at all, but basically the over 95% of our posterior over here on the um, goal direct response is that it's shifting earlier in time. Um, um, so we replicated this in another experiment using arrows instead of colors, uh, same, same result and moving on the goal. Um, what I think is really cool is that this only is in the context of conflict. Um, so you can give uh, people a task where they're just responding at a centrally located color or a location that's of a neutral color to get kind of an estimate of just responding location and responding to um, a, a goal in the center. Uh, and in isolation, when you offer rewards, um, people are faster at both of these. Um, so in orange here is now respond to color and blue is respond to location going from low to high value. Uh, when we put our models, those are both getting faster now. Um, so specifically in this complex scenario um, that we're seeing this spe selective speeding of the goal and actually no movement on the habit whatsoever. Um, so some conclusions from this uh, motivated Simon study. Um, I'm a big evangelist for these force response paradigms for, cognitive, for basically any cognitive tasks that we do. Um, if you guys vote for it, we can talk about what happens after an error that's really illuminating with this paradigm. Um, it's nice if you're interested in uh, habitual versus goal direct control because we can unmask these latent habits and basically get as many habitual responses as we want, which is just impossible to do with humans usually. Um, and it seems that rewards um, and motivation sharpens the preparation of specific goal directed actions uh, in these kind of complex scenarios and doesn't do much to the preparation of habitual actions. It's not enhancing inhibition, it is specifically this goal relevant information that you're uh, boosting up. OK, so rewards selectively enhance uh, goal directed processing under conflict. Um, OK, so now it's now it's voting time. Um, actually, maybe I should pause. I could pause for actually maybe let's do questions and answers. We have the remote crowd, um, but I'm happy to take any in the, in the interim, especially clarification questions that people would like. Um, OK, so now it's time to vote to refresh your memory. We can stay on kind of that modeling track looking at what happens after an error. Um, so adaptive control, you make an error. What do you do next? Um, this force response paradigm has been very limiting for that. We could look at specifically how rewards enhance uh, uh, the uh, uh, representation of skilled motor plans, uh, what's going on when we're choking under pressure. Um, I'll probably talk about the neuromaging experiment uh, that I did on that one, um, if people are interested. Uh, we could look specifically at the decision making, so vision mode decision making, deciding where to move and how incentives impact your decision making. Uh, or number five, uh, can motivation enhance working memory processes and what working memory processes specifically are enhanced by uh, reward. Um, so the way I usually do this on Zoom where I have a poll, but now I think we're going to have to raise hands. Um, so you can vote for two things if you want. I'm going to say number one, number two, number three, number four, number five. If it's something you're interested in, just raise your hand and I'll just go with whatever has the most votes. OK. You can you can vote on all five if you want to hear all of them, but I'm just going to I'm going to pick two. Yeah, two. Of the, I think we only have time for two. So um, so number one, what happens after an error? Okay, not as popular, man. That's a it's a cool one. Uh, number two, I think they're all cool, I guess. Uh, number two, uh, mo skilled motor plans reward. Okay, uh, that's more. Of, 
Okay, 15-ish. Uh, choking under pressure, uh, less than that, so that's more like 10. Uh, vision mark decision making, so it's also really cool. One, two, three, four, five. So you can vote for multiple things. Uh, that's about the same as the choking under pressure. And then working memory reward, uh, a little bit less. So it sounds like number two. Um, let me see, let me make sure that my hyperlink works. Bing. Okay, cool. Um, so uh, the tough thing is the transitions between since in voting kind of have like smooth, uh, smoother transitions. Um, so going uh, going back to rewards. Um, so there, I've been also very affected by um, uh, this review paper by Seiji Monahar and colleagues suggesting that what reward is doing is kind of paying the cost of noise reduction. Um, and so um, there's some uh, neuroimaging evidence and uh, just kind of basic cognitive control tasks that rewards can enhance these neural representations of, of the task that you're doing. Um, so um, this is a, kind of a similar uh, cognitive control task to the one I showed before, um, but people uh, are seeing face stimuli and word stimuli and they have kind of different tasks they could do. They could either respond based on the word or based on the face. They can get a cue suggesting whether this is uh, a face trial or a, uh, a word trial that you have to respond to. So it's Kind of this a uh, little bit of a task switching paradigm um and um what's cool is that uh you can um use some uh, uh classification techniques to try to read out from this cue uh, related activity uh what task someone is going to do in the future um, and uh, i think maybe most people are aware that you, you can do these kinds of classification tasks quite well um the neat finding i think um so um this is from a fairly widespread uh, set of areas for this study. Um, but if you look at, uh, if you pair these this task with rewards, like high reward and low reward, um, your classification accuracy goes up quite a bit in reading out what task someone's gonna do when people are more motivated, when you give people cash flexes. Um, so you see this kind of boost in your readout of the task someone's gonna do uh, with incentives. Um, so thinking about um, uh, motor control, there is a lot of evidence that motivation enhances what's called motor vigor. Um, so a classic task that you might see, uh, this is a task you do with monkeys or humans, it's a simple saccade task. Um, so uh, the subject just has to fixate centrally, you see some flash in the periphery, you just have to make a saccade over to that target. And if you pair these saccades with cash bonuses, you can have rewarded and not rewarded uh, saccades. Um, and what you see typically is that, um, so each one of these dots is a single uh, animal in this case, these are all uh, uh, monkeys. Um, and this is saccade velocity on non-rewarded uh, trials and rewarded trials. And as you can see, every monkey is above uh, this diagonal, suggesting that when there's reward at stake, they're moving more quickly. Um, uh, so enhancing the bigger of their motor actions. Um, so in the motor control literature, uh, most people think that it's on the action side and not the planning side. Um, and so when you ask this question, how does motivation improve the performance of motor skills? Um, most people say it's enhancing execution, energizing movement. Um, you just move more, all your movements come out more quickly. Um, uh, so we're kind of interested in how much of this can be attributed to actually enhancing the motor plans um, in advance. Um, so you have, it's not just that your movements are coming out faster, but your planning is more efficient, basically. Um, so we have a behavioral study that came out a couple of years ago that, started, that suggested this, but we wanted to see if we could use neuroimaging uh, to see if what rewards are doing is actually enhancing the, these early representations of your movement uh, before you actually move. Um, so the task that we used uh, for this study is what's called a discrete sequence production task. It's very similar to a serial reaction time task, if you've ever seen a task like that. Um, the basic idea is that participants see these four boxes like, on the screen. Um, these four boxes map onto the four fingers of uh, one of their hands, actually the left hand in our case for the study, I believe. Um, as soon as one of those boxes lights up, you press the corresponding finger. And so you could, as soon as you press that button, another one's going to light, light up in a sequence. So in our study, it's uh, eight item sequences. Um, and you can give people these repeating sequences uh, that they will uh, learn over time and get much faster trained sequences than they would untrained sequences. Um, uh, so this is our, our motor skill, is how well you could type out these sequences under a specified time limit. Um, in this study, we gave people these sequence identity cues and ahead of time. So uh, we had a red sequence and a blue sequence that people would learn. They had a day that came in um, prior uh, where they practiced just these two sequences for 45 minutes or so. Um, and then they'd come back a couple days later and uh, do the same thing uh, in the scanner, playing for cash bonuses. Um, so I believe this study was, I think, $5, $10, and $30 for each trial. Same thing as last time we pick one at random uh, at the end. Um, 
So uh, in advance, they see this reward queue and the sequence identity queue. All um, uh, oh, right, so I have the task. So they do uh, training um, and then they come back on uh, two different sequences. They come back to play for cash bonuses. Um, the data I'm showing you today is just from this uh, task period where they're playing for cash bonuses. Um, again, the trial looks like this. And what we're going to be looking at is uh, activity here before they start moving. Um, can we read out what sequence you're going to type in advance? OK. Um, and how does reward impact our readout of what uh, of what action you're about to perform? Um, so if we just take a look at uh, just behavioral performance. Um, so what I'm plotting over here on the left uh, is success rate. So um, we uh, actually set time limits individually to try to keep people around 50% uh, performance. Um, but as you can hopefully see, it, um, reward people are more accurate uh, at these high level, uh, high reward uh, values relative to low reward values. And this isn't a speed action trade off. People are also faster. OK, so on the right is their speed, how many keys they press per second. So they're both faster and more accurate when we give cash bonuses on this uh, skill bonus task. Um, so the first, we took a couple different steps with the neuroimaging analysis. Uh, the first is to just uh, look at univariate brain activity, what areas are scaling with reward value. OK, we get it. Half the brain is scaling with reward value. Okay, so these are reward responsive uh, uh, areas. Um, so we wanted to ask the question: Okay, if we look at these reward responsive areas, uh, from where can we read out uh, what action someone's going to perform? Okay, so uh, essentially, uh, can we uh, train a classifier to distinguish between um, uh, these two actions? Um, and we can. Uh, also, fairly widespread set of areas that um, perhaps unsurprisingly, given it's like a vision motor uh, task. Um, but we can read out what action someone's about to perform. Um, and as a, a further step, we wanted to make sure that these representations um, uh, that we're reading out have something to do with the actual performance. Um, so we train a separate classifier uh, trying to figure out, uh, are you going to be, so you haven't moved yet, are you going to be correct in this trial or not? Okay. Um, so can we classify correct trials from incorrect trials? Um, we can do that also quite well from a more uh, uh, limited set of areas. And so what I'm showing here, are areas that simultaneously have, uh, we can read out whether you're going to be correct or not, which action you're going to do, and they also uh, um, uh, show some reward responsiveness. Um, yes, please. We, we don't have EMG data uh, uh, from, um, uh, from these subjects. No, we don't have that. Um, we don't we don't see anything in motor cortex for the reward scaling. I'm about just to foreshadow, <laughs> um, but we do. Well, maybe I'll just jump to it because it's the next slide. Um, so. um, yes, please. Yeah. This is a great question. Um, so this is before they start moving. So they haven't. Movements haven't happened yet, um, right? So like the this readout is before. Uh, let me go back to the. Um, um, so we're reading out from this time period before. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Sure. So you're pre you're preparing for your movement speed, essentially. Essentially. Sure. Sure. Um, so I suppose I'd argue that that is also part of your motor planning. That <laughs> um, preparing for like how quickly you're going to move is motor planning, right? <clears throat> so are we? It's not the representation of the task. Right. It's yeah. This is what we're talking about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think our analysis have to be agnostic with which of those two it is. Okay. I don't think we could rule that out. I don't think we can rule that out. Um, okay. So, um, so what I'm uh, plotting here is our ability to uh, distinguish between these actions at these different reward values separately. Um, so we can do, uh, we can get uh, basically in a leave one subject out way. We can get independent regions of interest using that pre-print previous analysis. So we can take everybody's data. Uh, find those areas that and everybody else is uh, selected for all three of these things and take a look at for that individual at these different reward values. How uh, efficient is our readout of what someone's about to do? And hopefully what pops out to everybody is kind of along this kind of suite of uh, mode preparation areas and 
this is NPR Promise Locals, if anybody cares, at the LPFC. Um, our readout is improved as we go from these low reward values to these high reward values. Okay. Um, so our, in some sense, we get a sharper readout or get a sharper code for action at these high reward values. Um, so behaviorally, reward and motivation, it does invigorate the performance of these motor skills. Um, these frontal parietal and uh, uh, motor areas that I showed on those previous slides have this, what we're calling a multiplex code for reward, action, and your probability of success, the quality of performance. Um, so we can simultaneously read out all three of these things from a, a set of areas. Um, but specifically, it looks like reward is sharpening uh, those neural representations of action during that motor planning period. Um, M1 does not show this effect, no. Yeah, so exactly, yeah. Uh, let me go back to... Um, so it is the case that um, M1, uh, we can read out the, the quality performance. We can read out uh, action, uh, specific contralateral M1, uh, um, and it does have this reward modulation. Uh, but when we try to do this analysis where we say, okay, now I'm looking at a specific individual, is my readout better as a reward goes up? We don't see it in M1. Yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah. No, we had cerebellum's analysis. Not, not basically. Uh, it comes out with reward modulation, but it doesn't come out with any of the other analyses. Um, yeah, I did that. Especially my my postdoc James loves the cerebellum. He'd be very upset that I don't have it on these slides. Uh, but we didn't we didn't find any results there. Yeah, yeah. That, so, you, if doing during the movement, you'll see like there's movement related activity in cerebellum, but we don't, and we see reward modulation and actually a decent amount of cerebellum, um, but we couldn't read out um, we, this. This analysis that you don't get any cerebellar, basically. Um, this, yeah, please. Question, yeah. Um, so we didn't. Uh, you should. Let me see. No, it's not. The slices aren't great. Um, you do. You do see it comes out. So like specifically, caught it comes out in all these analyses. It does not show that this last effect though. Um, this effect doesn't come out um, at all. Really, it's just flat. I mean, it could be that just. Small area or decoding might be bad, especially because we're like defining our eyes, leave one subject out. Like those, mm -hmm. just the variability in that might just not be good for that individual. I expected actually to see, see that, um, but it didn't come out. Um, okay. Any other? Okay. So we get to vote again. Um, so we did number two. I'm just gonna. I think. Let's just do. We'll do a quick hand raise again. Number one. Uh, oh, come on, guys. Good one. Uh, number three, I want to do number one. Uh, okay, okay. Four and five. I think it was three, I think. Uh, okay, joking under pressure. Changing gears again. Um, Charles Barkley, what's going on with Charles Barkley? His <laughs> hideous golf swing. Um, <laughs> So um, kind of the experimental roots of this idea goes all the way back to Yerkes Dotson curves uh, and rodents, you know, 100 years ago or more. Um, basic idea is that for uh, easy tasks, uh, if you're not motivated, if arousal is low, performance pressure is low, you don't do very well. As uh, performance pressure arousal goes up, you get better and there's some mass to it where you just stay at ceiling levels of performance. Um, but for more challenging tasks, there seems to be uh, this sweet spot. So if you're not motivated, don't do well, then uh, you can be in the sweet spot where you have the perfect level of performance pressure or arousal or motivation where you do well. And then uh, when that gets too big, it drops off again. And so um, this kind of drop off is something that I've been really curious about and interested in for quite a long time. Uh, so what is uh, responsible for this kind of drop off in performance uh, as performance pressure arousal goes up? Um, and then the cognitive psychology literature there's kind of like two competing theories of what could be going on uh, when people are choking under pressure. Um, both making appeals to kind of cognitive control processes, but kind of in the exact opposite way. Um, so one idea is that in these really high pressure situations, what's going on is that you're actually distracted. So you're worried about failure or what other people think. Uh, this actually leads to some reduced cognitive control over the task you're trying to do, and that's why you fail. Um, on the other hand, we have these, I call it explicit monitoring or, um, uh, I'm going to leave explicit monitoring because it's on the slide. Um, but the basic idea behind this explicit monitoring hypothesis is that specifically um, for highly automatized actions, uh, what's going on is like, oh, this is a big pressure moment. I really want to take control of that action, make sure I do it right. Uh, but you may have 
access to those kind of like low level commands. Um, so um, you're actually resting control away from any kind of autopsized action to like take control of the step by step uh, uh, movements. And so it's excess or misallocated cognitive control. Um, so both of these predict the same behavioral profile. Um, so you're going to get this drop off of, uh, performance. So it can be a little bit challenging to uh, kind of distinguish between uh, uh, these two um, uh, possibilities. Um, so uh, because I'm a glutton for punishment, I thought it'd be fun to try to use fMRI to try to disentangle these two uh, in my postdoc. Um, it was a fun, it was a fun time. Um, so I developed a, a kind of a brand new novel motor task. This is by manual motor task where people had to, I don't know if anybody's played that snake game on a phone where you have to control the snake to eat an apple. I kind of uh, modified that to be, um, you have to you control the snake to eat this giant apple across the screen. Um, and the way you can control that is with like two little mouse scroll wheels in the scanner. One is controlling the speed of the snake. The other is the steering of the snake. So turning left and right. Um, and you had to get to the apple under a certain time limit. Um, and you couldn't be going max speed when you get there. So it's kind of this pretty challenging by manual motor task that people um, had to come up with. Um, we can vary time deadlines and speed constraints and size of the apple again to kind of set difficulty for each individual separate. Um, so just like that previous task I was uh, uh, talking about, people came in, they trained this task for a day, they came back um, and played this game for cash bonuses uh, in the scanner. Um, so I spent a long time um, trying to figure out a reward scheme that elicit this joke under pressure for this task. Um, happy to talk about that. It's, there's a lot of piloting. Uh, there's some tricks to it, actually. Um, but after a lot of uh, uh, piloting, we um, found this reward scheme that could kind of try to reproduce this joke under pressure curve, uh, where people kind of can see both sides. So people get better as, motive, as uh, reward value grows, but also they do poor at the um, highest reward values. Um, so, um, Again, the data I'm going to be showing is from this kind of pre-period just before they move. What's the state of the system that's going to lead people to success or failure on this task? Um, so just to look at behavior performance, um, hopefully it's pretty clear that people have this kind of inverted U-shaped uh, 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 behavior profile where they get better for five to ten dollars, but then they start doing worse again with these four dollar trials. Um, so for this study, um, we uh, did a um, Functional connectivity analysis. So our reasoning was that whatever is going wrong eventually is going to have to be communicating with the motor cortex. Um, so we thought we would seed motor cortex uh, to see what areas are communicating with motor cortex. Um, and I think maybe a lot of people, since this, I know some neuroimaging heavy, heavy crowd, are familiar with this kind of analysis. Um, but the basic idea is that you can look at activity in motor cortex over time. Um, and you can ask the question, OK, what other areas are uh, kind of activities going along with motor cortex uh, across trials. And you could look at this separately for those high value trials, people are tending to be joking under pressure, uh, and these medium value trials, people are doing just great. Um, and so we can ask the question, are there uh, any areas that change their functional connectivity pro pattern uh, profile with motor cortex as we go from these like medium reward values doing great to these um, uh, high reward values? Um, and what we found is essentially it was only uh, kind of these uh, lateral frontal areas um, along inferior frontal sulcus that uh, seems to have increased communication with motor cortex, uh, specifically on these high value trials versus these uh, medium value trials. Um, um, and so on first pass, uh, this is this is like, oh, maybe it's this monitoring thing, but I, this could be, depending on your flavor of what you like in terms of those theories, it could be evidence for both theories. Um, I'm going to kind of walk us through what I mean by that. Um, so you might, if you favor these monitoring theories, you might predict that OK, if you are a person who's joking under pressure, you're going to show a, uh, increased connectivity. Uh, so increased connectivity should be coinciding with uh, uh, worse performance under pressure. Um, however, if you like these distraction theories, um, you might think, oh, what's going on is that you're distracted in type of situations. You need to engage in more control just to have a good level of performance. So you might predict uh, the opposite profile, right? So you might predict that um, uh, those folks who are choking under pressure actually have uh, impaired connectivity or aren't able to increase connectivity to deal with this kind of distraction. Um, and so this uh, latter trend is exactly what we found in our data. Um, I think you should take this effects as the grain of salt, as we talked about uh, a Bain behavioral correlations earlier with some, some folks. Um, but what we found is that those individuals who are choking under pressure are the ones who actually had uh, impaired communication or not improved communication, at least uh, connectivity between uh, this lateral frontal area and motor cortex. And those folks who are choking under pressure, specifically those ones, or who were who just fine under pressure, the ones who were actually able to increase uh, functional connectivity at these high reward values. Um, so large rewards can elicit these kind of paradoxical failures in performance. Um, 
Uh, and it seems that functional connectivity between motor cortex and these lateral frontal areas are increased at these large ward values. Um, but this increased connectivity seems to be projected into organic pressure, if anything. Um, and I really want to point out this is for a, a novice scale. Um, so this could be very different for people who are experts. Um, people had a day of training on this. I, I imagine it might um, be a little different for people who are experts. Or actually, one of the things that was paused over the pandemic was a kind of long-term training study on these sequence learning tasks that were looking at experts, um, which has just resumed. So hopefully we get to ask fun, a lot of fun questions about those folks soon. Um, you just talked about lateral Yeah. Change the meaning of these bullet points. Because when you look at it, yeah, it's the LPFC. Yeah. Sure, but it's slow as possible. Uh, pretty much to be, could be further, uh, maybe, maybe further back. Yeah, yeah. 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 Um, yeah. And these are all like middle frontal gyrus if you're still frontal sulcus, yeah. basically. So yeah. You, you know, I, yeah, I know, I know. I, uh, you see a little, like, didn't, I don't think it survived. We see some ACC, like kind of like yeah. medial frontal uh, for this specific analysis, but. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, has to be, has to be. It should be through premotor cortex. <laughs> So, sure. This is. Yeah, I think this goes back to like what, what is functional connectivity indexing exactly, right? Yeah. Like that's a yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, so um, I didn't show, uh, it's not shown here, but I, so I was curious about this. If you seed, if you seed SMA or premotor cortex, at, which I don't understand how this is possible, but if you see those other motor, if you see those other motor areas, this, these same lateral frontal areas pop out. But if you see motor cortex, I think it's because motor cortex and, and this SMA and premotor areas across different word values are very highly synced. So when you do the subtraction, it doesn't come out, right? So like, it's very much the case that if I do all trials and I see motor cortex, the entire, you know, premotor SMA, it's all much connected. They don't show any differential connectivity across reward values for those. Um, so yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a bit of, I would have assumed you'd see it cascading all the way through that, but it doesn't, it didn't come out. So, um, um, okay, it's 1249. I could try to do, I mean, this is one of the, one of the nice things about choosing a I could try to go through another one. I don't know what time you got, you all normally end. Okay. Okay, I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to do what happens after an error because I'm really excited about this one and nobody's voting for it. So, because uh, um, I really like this force response task. I think it's, um, I don't know, we have a bunch of grants in looking at it for a whole host of things. I think it's really interesting. Um, okay, switching gears again. Uh, I, we make mistakes all the time. I think for us, we're uh, particularly interested um, in people making errors in our cognitive tasks. Um, so, and all sorts of, it's basically any task that has has been looked at. One thing that people always find uh, after people make an error is that they slow down, okay? Um, so if you look at re mean response time, typically after correct trials, you get a little bit faster. You make an error, it's usually pretty fast, and then you slow down. Um, and the slowdown is not just returning regression to the mean back to where you were. It's like above and beyond your mean levels of uh, mean response time, you slow down even more. Um, no, it's supposed to say adapt, adaptive control, actually. Um, and so this is seen in, you know, language tasks, cognitive control tasks, basic arbitrary symbol mapping tasks. Um, and the dominant explanation for this is response caution. Um, so you have the speed actually curve. If you're going fast, you're not going to be very accurate. You make a mistake, you, you move along the same curve and you're more accurate now. Um, when you do um, 
any kind of uh, uh, people have tried to use these evidence accumulation models on this kind of post error uh, slowing and post error uh, effects. And so the basic idea here is that if you're accumulating evidence and you're waiting to cross some boundary before you make a response, you can have a risky and fast threshold that you make a response more quickly, but it's more prone to errors. And after an error, maybe you just go safe and slow and you move and you wait longer to accumulate more evidence. Um, the problem is that in the vast majority of studies, people don't get better after an error. So they're slower and less accurate, actually. So if you go back to even the, some of the early studies, um, errors follow each other simply more often than we'd expect it by chance, even though you're slower. More recent work, same thing, more errors after errors than correct trials. Um, and so that leads us to this puzzle. Well, if people are just having response caution, they should be more accurate, but they're not. So cognitive processing is affected in some way negatively by the error. Um, so right, so uh, error rate after correct trials and after um, after errors is much higher always, and you're slower. And but you know it, the dominant explanation has been this response caution, and specifically with those models, this threshold change is such a massive effect that you don't see anything else. Um, so we thought we could use this forced response paradigm to kind of disentangle that. We can force people to respond, make sure they can't slow down, and see an index of uh, uh, exactly how their cognitive processing is affected by these errors. Um, so for this task, it's a really simple task, uh, arbitrary um, for alternative response, uh, for alternative force choice task, where each of these uh, symbols is mapped onto one of uh, uh, your four fingers. Um, again, same thing. We have these RTQs. We can vary when we present the stimulus to really build this um, speed action curve. Um, um, so importantly, we only give people timing feedback. So the error is their own perception. The error we're not giving flashing lights or anything. That's like you made a mistake. Um, People know when they make errors. Um, um, OK, I will go through this pretty quickly. Is I have cool animations, so I got to show it. <laughs> um, so again, uh, what we are just assuming is that your responses are prepared at some time with some variability. Once we estimate this, um, and so in yellow is like how much time we give you to respond, we can get a, a probability of how likely you are to have a response prepared. So probability that you're ready at that time point, probability not ready. Um, and we assume that when you don't have a response prepared, you're just guessing randomly. So in this case, 25% because there's four responses. And if the response is prepared, we assume that uh, this isn't 100% effective. Sometimes you have an action slip, but in general, this is very high, 97%. Um, and we can estimate this from our data. Uh, if, if you're likely to have a response prepared, how often does it, uh, does it come out? And so this modeling can reproduce these, um, I already showed you this, but can reproduce those um, uh, kind of speed accuracy functions. Um, and so we can get out this model is uh, this mean of this uh, distribution, how long it takes to prepare a response, how vari uh, variable are you across trials, and how uh, efficacious is this response preparation. Um, and so what's nice about that is these map on to different hypotheses for what happens after an error. Um, so it could be that after an error, your cognitive processing itself is slowed down. It's not just response caution, but your stimulus response, response processing itself is actually slowed. Could be that you're just more variable after an error. You, you know, maybe you're a little flustered, you freak out, you just have more variability in that stimulus response processing. Um, or it could just all come out that you're just less uh, uh, effective. Uh, so you've uh, potentially prepared a response, but you have more action slips after an error. Um, okay, so results. Um, same kind of plot, accuracy, chance level is 25%. Uh, people are at chance levels of performance up until about 500 milliseconds. Fairly quickly, they get up to uh, seeing levels of performance around uh, one second. But hopefully what pops out at everybody is that they never, even if we give people two full seconds to respond, they never get back to their level of performance after an error. Um, uh, so they make more errors uh, uh, after errors, basically, regardless of how much time we give them. Um, and so this maps on quite well to that last uh, hypothesis I, I, I laid out um, that people are, are uh, decreasing what we're calling efficacy or more action slips after um, uh, an error. Um, and so um, in terms of our, our modeling, we see no change in the speed or standard deviation of these uh, response preparation distributions um, after an error. Um, but again, this is the change on that efficacy parameter that uh, um, and our, all of our evidence is that it's going down. Um, and so um, I won't talk about all four of these experiments, all these experiments, but basically across four different experiments, it's always comes out. It's only in this action slips, this efficacy uh, parameter. Um, and so one thing that we were worried about is like, oh, you know what's happening? People are making error. Uh, they press the index finger. That was wrong. For trial n plus one, they're just biased away from pressing their index finger. They just like don't want to make the same mistake. So it's a slight bias. And they, if it happens to be that they should have pressed that button, they don't get it. Um, it's exactly the exact opposite, however. Um, so what I'm plotting here is your probability of repeating the same response after a correct trial and after an error. 
And across all four experiments, after you make an error, you're much more likely to repeat the same erroneous response that just came out before. Um, so we're calling this perseverative slips of action. So I press the index finger, crap, that was the wrong button. The next trial, you're way more likely to do that again, okay? Um, that seems to be driving uh, uh, all, all of these kind of results. Um, so what happens when we make an error, when you can't slow down, when you have no, you can't do use response caution? What is leading to all this increase in errors in performance that we've seen in previous uh, studies? We've ruled out that your cognitive processing is slower in any way. Can't be that. We've ruled out that your cognitive processing is noisier and the stimulus response processing is noisier. Um, instead, it seems that errors are impairing the, what we're calling the efficacy of this cognitive processing and lead to an increase in these perseverative, perseverative slips of action. Um, and so what we're trying to argue is that the post-error slowing that we see in part is this response caution, but it's also might be an adaptive to response to impaired processing on the current trial. Uh, so there is some impairment in processing that you're adapting to uh, online with your uh, with your slowing, uh, as well as just moving along the same speed accuracy curve. Um, okay, I realized that was quick, but I wanted to get through it um, in the time. And then uh, just to uh, uh, finish up, um, I know I've talked to a few more folks uh, after, so I just wanted to throw up other kinds of things we're working on in case anybody's interested in it. Um, a lot of these are just restarting, so I'm really excited about them, but we don't have any, maybe it's CNS, we'll present some stuff, but I'm just going to CNS. But um, I talked about expertise a little bit. We're doing a lot of TMS fMRI studies now, uh, looking at cerebellum's work, role in working memory and um, a lot of frontal cortex and uh, motor promoter areas and the development of motor skills. Um, recently got a grant from Parkinson's Foundation to do uh, a lot of work with Parkinson's patients, looking at um, kind of motivation, action, cognition links uh, and Parkinson's disease as well. Um, so I just want to, I wasn't sure which one everybody's going to vote for. Um, uh, I think most of the work Tyler is first author on, graduating uh, PhD student. Um, and thanks to the rest of the folks in my lab and uh, funding sources. And thanks for you all, and thanks for the little kids at home who don't have daddy right now. Um, <laughs> uh, but happy to take any uh, any questions on any of this stuff, really. Thank you. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, with the gauze cutters yep. and how under stress you see that they have uh, your uh, nervous system and mm -hmm. your nervous network mm -hmm. and how the stress modulates the, mm -hmm. the, um, the effect of how many patients are on it. How that study and how with the regard um, and the connecting with the school with the PhD. Yeah, so I, um, we don't have any like for our studies. We have we never took any specific indexes like you know we didn't do you know cortisol or anything like that to like validate any kind of like stress measures. But I imagine you know you see this a lot with like resilience to any kind of challenge. You see often more the LPFC activity ramping up. So it, it could be very uh, similar. Yeah. Like the high reward. Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of the trick with yeah. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, with a lot of choking under pressure studies, they'll kind of, it won't be just reward, they'll kind of load you up with a lot of different kinds of performance pressure. So um, they'll do reward and social pressure. And so let's, the standard paradigm is something like, um, okay, you practice, now we're gonna play for cash bonuses, you're paired with a partner. Uh, in order for you to earn extra money, both you and your partner have to improve. Your partner already did great, now it's all riding on you. And oh, by the way, I'm gonna videotape you while we do this, because I have to train some people and I'm gonna have my research assistant standing there with lab codes. So you can like kind of, load up all different sorts of pressure. Um, I kind of wanted to just use reward to see the up and down of it if I could. And there's been a couple other fMRI studies looking at choking and pressure, just use reward. But it is kind of a trick. So like in order for you to get choking and pressure with just reward by itself, you have to have uh, really rare, the high reward values have to be relatively rare. They can't be blocked. Um, so if you put, as soon as you get like two or three of those four trials in a row, you kind of habituate to it a little bit. So like there's kind of little tricks to get it to, to get it to where it took a, long, it took a long time to kind of figure all that out. Um, um, but I, from from subjects self report, at least, they do seem to be a little bit more stressed out in these high value ones, uh, especially if they're like rare and come infrequently, relatively infrequently. Uh, yes. I'm looking at Like if you ask 
people, how much they care, how much they um, how much it bothers you? So, like, what, so what's happening? Yeah. Um, so, I think, um, I think I might have extra slides for this to show. Um, so, one thing that we were worried about, um, which is like kind of similar, is like maybe uh, after an error, you're just like transiently flustered or something like that, and like you just miss the stimulus because you're like, ah, I just made a mistake. Um, and people have shown that like if you, so this is the experiment we did actually, is that if you um, have a longer intertrial interval, people don't show post error slowing as much. Uh, so we thought, oh, what if we give people a lot of time to recover in between trials? So we had these two extra experiments. Um, one, that they're coming really rapidly, so zero intertrial interval. So like you make a mistake and the next one's just coming. Or we give people a relatively long, we have a full two seconds between. Uh, um, and, uh, well, let me zoom in on them. Um, so this is after zero milliseconds, so it's coming back to back to back. Basically, it's all in that same, uh, where's my cursor? Uh, efficacy parameter, same thing. You're just getting this like kind of mean shift down that people are less um, effective after um, an error. But the same thing is happening with longer ITI. Um, so this effect is larger uh, at the short ITIs, but it's all the same thing, right? It's not a different class of thing that's happening. Um, so I, I think there is some, you know, maybe flustering going on or something like that, if you want to call it that, but it's all coming out of this perseverative action slips. And even if you give people, so at this point, um, they have a full two seconds in between trials. They have a full two seconds, the stimulus on the screen for two seconds. Like they should be, they, they know the stimulus is there. They should be getting it right, but they're just not getting back up to their same level of performance. Yeah. So I, I love this idea of action slips and the fact that people are using the same, So yeah, um, the funny thing, I, I really thought it was going to be the opposite. I thought it was going to be, I made this error. I don't want to do that because that was an error. Um, but like I would expect that that would, ha uh, if that were true, you should see the same. I mean, if they were like figuring out some probability of responding, you'd think it'd be the same after correct trials and incorrect trials, right? Um, but it, we only see this perseveration after errors, um, right? So um, like the way I think about it is that you have this kind of, um, you press a button, uh, that action is now like a little bit more fluent. It's so kind of your, maybe your default policy. And uh, especially when we ask you quickly, but even up to two seconds, like that, it's just a little easier to come out after. Um, yes. So just this, all uh, this one, uh, yeah, I think that up to 35, up to 35. Okay, yeah. So, yeah. So, so this was uh, online data from Prolific, and I think we, it's 18 to 35. I think it's actually pretty evenly distributed between that and that range. That. Yeah. Um, is there evidence that this holds or extends in older adults? Post air slowing does. Yeah. yeah. No, but I mean, in terms of the speed that makes it more. Right. So I'm not aware of anybody who's. I what like I, I was looking actually for this specifically post air perseveration, and I there's some. One, I was actually talking to a couple of folks the other day. There's some rodent work that suggests maybe, but I haven't seen anything with humans. People have perseverate, especially when you get older. Like perseveration happens, but specifically this post error increase in perseveration, I haven't seen anywhere before. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I wanted to know if you asked about stimulus. Because I think that can have a big impact. What, stimulant. What? Like, oh, stimulant? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, we. I'm trying to think of our screening Maybe criteria now. Question, yeah. Sure. 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 Yeah. 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 Yeah.
so I know we, I mean, we screen out like drug use, fast drug yeah, use, like prop, but so it's, but we don't, I mean, especially with online data, it's not like we have, yeah, no, that's an interesting question. Yeah, no, I was thinking, I was thinking caffeine specifically, caffeine or nicotine, I'm saying like, yeah. Um, that's an interesting question, actually. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cannot override their prepotent responses, those Uber drivers, yeah. That young adults who are impacted, so when you ask people to yeah. after error, yeah. you make mistakes. Like, I need to look at that. That's interesting. Um, anyway, do you, I might hit you, off yeah, no, I might hit you up for a reference on that. Yeah. Um, other, yes. Mm. Right, so I, I think the question is if um, if you have people under pressure, are they going to have more of these kinds of perceptive errors? That is a good question. We haven't, you know, we have the reward. I don't know if we're going to equate reward with pressure necessarily or arousal, but we could look at this in that we have looked. We had to have a we have a, a bunch of stuff looking at um, cognitive control tasks. I don't think we've looked at this post error stuff in that. That would be an interesting question. I would imagine. I would guess it would it would happen more at the higher reward values, I think, but it, I don't know, it's tricky. Um, the short interval is pressure, though, right? That's yeah. true, and you see the same thing. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, I was doing it. yeah. I, I I honestly thought that we get a different um, that these two, but like if you look at them like the modeling at the bottom, it's like literally the same thing. It's like you're not changing the speed of preparing responses or the noise. It's like all in this efficacy. It's it's the same class of thing. It's just you get less of it. Um, yes. Oh, this. You actually have 25% chance of hitting the repeat, which is one out of four options. Yeah. But the moment you hit the error, it's jumped yeah, to like anywhere around 40, 50%. I mean, like. Thing, if you had an experiment which had multiple choices, like only two choice or both yeah. choice or three choice, it could be fascinating to see how the number of options drive that. Yeah, the perseveration. Now you're, you guys are making me want to look at our Simon tasks with this now because it's only two I mean granted you have this congruent and congruent thing that could um well I should take it because uh, so we were we started off thinking about looking at it with assignment but then it because you make more errors on incongruent trials it's like you get these weird order effects where it's like okay is this because you made an error because it was incongruent and then like just the number of trials you get but we could just do a simple like yeah no I know like a we could just easily do like location respond to location there's only two of them um and see where people go yeah yeah, and the nice thing, I'm also a big evangelist for collecting behavior data online. You could you can like program that and get a bunch of subjects in like a weekend, you know? Uh, so like the pace of this force response stuff has been really quick just because you get 100 subjects in like, you know, 72 hours or whatever. Um, and so you can really like iterate and do these kinds of things really quickly, it's cool. Well, let's formally end this and then people can to walk up after cool. and ask some more questions. So yeah. thank you so much. Thank you guys very much. Still an online audience, oh yeah, online questions. Sorry, I forgot. We do the... have one question. Okay. Um, they asked, did you see any learning modulation in the caudate? Um, learning modulation in the caudate for the sequence learning tasks. Is that the question? Uh, that's all the question says. Um, I don't know that we can. So. We have a long term training study that's like six weeks of training that we do see a lot of that um, for the studies I presented. Those are all like one session, so we see. Um, we do see like caudate activity for these motor tasks uh, generally, uh, but I don't think we saw any training related changes that I can recall. We have the data to look at that, but we never we haven't done any like day one versus day two stuff, so I'm not sure if there's any learning changes that we I mean people have shown that in the past though, so. I would assume it's going on, um, but I didn't look at it for any of the sets that I presented today. And that's all we have online. Cool. Thank you. Thank you.